Welcome to today's webinar. My name is Matthew Darius. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator here at New York ASBO, and I'll be your moderator today. Before we uh, hand things over to our presenters, I just wanted to let you know how you can participate today. On your GoToWebinar control panel, which is typically on the right-hand side of your screen, there's going to be two different windows you can use. One's the chat window. Feel free to chat in there if you have any questions or you need to get a hold of me. There's also a questions window. We would prefer that if you have any questions for our presenters, you use that window. Uh, that is a threaded messaging service that helps us keep track of your questions. Uh, and we encourage you to ask questions at any time. I will break in and make sure our presenters get your questions answered as soon as I can. With that out of the way, I'm going to turn uh, the webinar over to Deborah Cunningham. Deborah. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I am Deborah Cunningham, Director of Education and Research at the New York State Association of School Business Officials. You have joined an online conversation with practitioners. Our topic is tax cap issues for 2016. The governor's budget recommendations are now out, and school districts are moving from low budget season to high budget season. The governor recommended a $991 million increase for schools in 2016-17, including increases in two important aids, $266 million in foundation aid and $189 million in the restoration of gap elimination adjustment cuts to school districts. While this 4% increase falls short of the 10% recommended by New York State ASBO, the Regents, and others, it also ignores an important reality for school districts. School districts face a tax cap that essentially allows for no increase at all. And if that's not enough, there will be a star tax rebate for eligible taxpayers in school districts that stay within the cap. This rebate will be in place throughout the use of the tax cap until 2020. So how will districts budget this year? Do the governor's budget recommendations suggest that state aid to school districts will make up the difference? Will school districts override the tax cap? Where can school districts look for efficiencies to stay within the tax cap? Alternatively, will school districts need to cut important programs or increase class sizes to make ends meet? Today, our online conversation with practitioners features four practitioners from three school districts a low-wealth city school district struggling to raise student achievement, a high-wealth suburban school district, which depends on local taxes for the majority of their revenues, and a rural district, one of the few with a successful tax cap override last year. With me today is Dr. Larry Spring, superintendent of Schenectady City School District, Mary Callahan, assistant superintendent for business at the Port Washington Union Free School District, and Superintendent Scott Taylor and Business Manager Kendra Sieber from Rural Tioga Central School District. As you will hear, these are three very different school districts and all face real challenges in budgeting this year. As you listen, listen to the questions and answers, I encourage you, the audience, to submit questions to panel members. Please name the panel member to whom you are directing your question and enter your question <coughs> in the questions or chat box. I'm going to ask Matt Darius to read the questions as they come up so that our practitioners can respond. So let me start with Superintendent Spring. Schenectady is a small city, high need school district. Schenectady is one of the poorest school districts in the state and its wealth has been declining in recent years. What were your reactions to the governor's budget recommendations released uh, recently? Expect to have a budget shortfall this year and will you consider exceeding the cap? Thank you for for uh, having me, Deborah. Yes, um, you know we do expect to have a budget shortfall this year. I think that uh, you know we we were disappointed in the governor's initial uh, salvo in uh, the education budget. Um, you know, it seemed to be the way that uh, legislators were talking about and the government was talking about uh, different programs and and pots of money. We expected um, you know a, a more substantive uh, proposal. Um, and certainly more substance into uh, the foundation aid uh, side of things. So the proposal that uh, that he put out would uh, result in a significant shortfall for our district. Um, it would mean uh, continuing to do uh, you know some pairing of our programs and uh, trimming of our offerings and 
primarily that's because uh, you know, we, we would not consider exceeding the tax cap. That's uh, something that we've already talked about um, you know, as a governance body, the Board of Education and myself, um, and exceeding uh, the cap is not something that, that we would we be willing to ask our taxpayers for. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Mary Callahan, uh, Port Washington is a low-need, relatively affluent school district on Long Island. As such, it is a district that depends on local revenues for the majority of its budget. What were your reactions to the governor's proposal? Are you expecting a budget shortfall this year, and will you, be, will you consider exceeding the cap? Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me. Um, you have described us well, Deborah. <laughs> Uh, we do not anticipate at this moment to exceed the cap, although uh, the board is going to have a community forum uh, for just that discussion. Um, at this time, uh, we're very unhappy with the governor's proposal as well. Uh, we have seen only $200,000 additional in GEA aid. All other aids are expenditure-driven aids that we would have received anyhow. Uh, we will be able to maintain a rollover budget if we continue to use down our fund balance. Um, and so the discussion with the community will be with growing enrollment different from many others. Can we consider exceeding the cap or um, discuss further the, uh, the issues that we will deal with next year if we are unable to uh, increase staffing. Thank you, Mary. Now that GEA you're going to get, the 200000 that's only a small portion of the GEA that you're still due? Yes. Uh, we're still due another 400000 The total each year um, should have been a million dollars. So we have lost over six million dollars in aid during the GEA period. Yeah. So the governor's proposal is really falling short on GEA in particular. Yes. yes. Exactly. Yeah. And I think um, um, Larry Spring mentioned it was quite uh, inadequate in terms of foundation aid as well. Let me turn to Superintendent Scott Taylor and Kendra Seaver from Tioga. Tioga Central School is a high-need rural district. When it comes to the tax cap, your district is, is especially interesting. Last year, Tioga's tax cap override was defeated in the first vote and then passed with the second vote also for an override. What are your reactions to the governor's proposal? Do you anticipate a budget shortfall this year, and will you consider consider exceeding the cap again? Yeah. Uh, again, thank you for for having Tom Central as part of this discussion. Um, yeah. You know, we were very disappointed in the governor's proposal. Uh, you know, foundation aid for us is still drastically short. We're about 2.3 million short of the full phase-in amount that we should be getting still. And, you know, looking across the state, we see that there are many districts that are at full phase and many of them districts of average need. So, you know, that's, that is particularly disappointing for us because even a 25% even a increase of, of our shortage would make a huge difference in our budget that is going to be just shy of $18 million. Um, so, you know, what that leaves us is in a position of, of uh, if we are going to even roll over our budget and apply a pretty healthy amount of fund balance to it, we're still going to have a shortfall of over about 250000 So we're going to be looking at about a 7% levy increase. Um, our 1% for Tauga Central raised $35,000. So we're looking at about a 6 to 7% increase just rolling over our budget. So definitely above the tax cap. Um, and, uh, you know, we made a decision last year uh, that after about six years consecutively of, of reducing uh, staff here across the board by about 20 percent and cutting into student programs, that we had had enough of the cutting and, and uh, we decided we were going to go out 
at a pretty high levy increase. And, and the number we used last year to start was, was 30% because we felt if we could get 30% through, we'd have to go above the cap probably once. And I would readjust our, our levy because, again, as I said, our levy raises about 35000 So that would have made a major adjustment for us. Now, that levy increase would have taken our tax on true up to about $12.50. Uh, but that failed in the, uh, the first go around with the budget. So the second time we went out at uh, just slightly above 17%. The impact of tax on true, we're now about $10 per thousand. Um, so again, well below most districts uh, within our region where the average is about $20 uh, per thousand in tax on true. So again, to refer back to the governor's proposal, uh, even a even a slightly more modest uh, appropriation of fund balance would would be significant for us. But we will definitely be looking at going out above the tax cap um, because we're just we've gotten to the point where if we continue to reduce, we're going to have a school that we're not people won't stay in our community. They're going to they're going to move and take their kids to districts where there's more opportunity. Now, you mentioned a very interesting thing, which is that you're still due quite a bit of foundation aid for full implementation of the formula that was enacted in 2007, but that some school districts are fully funded with foundation aid. And I just want to comment on that. I know um, Schenectady is also way underfunded. They have uh, about $60 million that's due to them under the foundation formula that was approved in 2007 but never fully implemented. The reason um, is that the 2007 formula introduced poverty into the basic formula so that high poverty uh, districts would be receiving the funding through the foundation aid to uh, provide an adequate education to all students. Um, many of it also included safe harmlesses and so over time those school districts that have perhaps less poverty and receive the same harmless um, have uh, plenty of money and those high poverty districts are tending to be less uh, well funded. So that's an interesting thing and of course ASBO has recommended that we get back to the business of phasing in foundation aid and do that expeditiously over the next three years. So uh, let me um, we, we know that the legislative process generally results in more funding for schools, that we will not hopefully stay with what the governor has proposed. But we also know how important it is for us to comment on the executive proposal. And I would just mention that New York State ASBO will do this today at the joint legislative budget hearing in Albany. Um, let's turn to some of the likely consequences of the executive proposal. And I'm going to start with Larry Spring. The executive proposal didn't comment on full funding on the foundation formula that has been stalled since 2009. If the state constrains local revenues and doesn't provide funding for an adequate education, what are the consequences to students in Schenectady? Well, I think you know we're going to see more of uh, you know what has been happening um, in places like Schenectady. So, you know, we're shorted. You know, as you said, 60 million dollars. That's not since the implementation of the foundation formula, that's a $62 million shortfall annually. Uh, and so how that's translated every year is, uh, you know, a pairing away in a reduction of services, um, you know, increasing class sizes, uh, elimination of electives, uh, reduction of supplementary or remedial academic services, um, you know, reduction of special areas, you know, you know all of those things that you know, kind of chipping away and, and, and bleeding away uh, things that, that we think are really important and necessary for school districts, especially when we think about, you know, kids, a large number of students who are living in poverty and neighborhood disorganization, they're coming to school and they've got an increased need for services uh, at school to, you know, to feed them, to help them get through mental health issues, to help them get caught up academically. Um, all of those things are being pared away from the district and, and you know not being able to fund ourselves locally uh, and not being provided uh, the aid that the law um, demands 
means that schools are going to be providing even less of those services and you know functionally what that will mean is um, you know a, a additional shortfalls in uh, you know achievement um, you know we see more schools I would anticipate falling into uh, receivership uh, and and the like everyone have a couple Larry. questions here Uh, the go first ahead. question is from uh, Kathy Barrett. Kathy, go ahead. You can answer a question right over the phone. Kathy, go right ahead and answer a question right over the phone, please. All right, we'll put her on hold for now. Uh, this next question is from Scott. Uh, he'd like to know when will they address the real problem of fixing the formula and let the aid flow as is instead of the original shares. Well, I, you know, I'd like to take a stab at that, if that's all right. This is Larry Spring. Um, you know, this is a, a conversation that I have uh, quite frequently. Um, you know, with uh, with senators, assemblymen, um, you know, with folks on the governor's staff. Um, you know, and and Senator Flanagan, who's now the majority leader. Um, has been, you know, even even though I, I I don't necessarily agree with his opinions or his positions, he's always been a fairly forthright um, and direct speaker, um, and and I I've always appreciated that. On this topic, um, what he's told me has led me to believe that it won't be happening. Um, and essentially, what he said, or or exactly what he said, is that the will is not there. Um, you know, there there are not enough folks in the Senate who want to see. Um, equity and funding. They don't want to see uh, foundation formula implemented and therefore um, don't expect it to happen. Uh, Larry, when you say it won't be happening, you mean full funding of the foundation formula? Correct. Well, that's, that is um, a, so, a very sobering uh, comment. Um, I, I know uh, in my experience working with the legislature and the governor, they hold those shares very dear, and it's very hard for them to give it up. It's worked for them over time, and it's part of their political negotiation process. However, you have the entire educational community saying, this formula works, uh, could be adjusted a little bit, but um, it's a good plan, and we should, we should commit to it and move forward. So I think we should continue to ask for that, because school districts need predictable funding. We know that poverty is the single most important factor to prevent school success. So let's provide the resources to encourage school success. So I'm sure that they'll, that will be mentioned quite a bit today at the budget hearing. Any other uh, comments on this question? Right. Let's, let's move to uh, Mary Callahan. When we think of low-need districts, we think of school districts with plenty of fund balance, essentially savings that, that you can draw on when times are tight. Is that the case for Port Washington? What are specific problems that you foresee for your district to continue education programs here? Exactly as you have said, fund balance is definitely uh, becoming an issue for the Port Washington School District. Uh, this is a community that um, has some extremely high wealth and uh, then we have a middle class and we have our incoming immigrant population. And our needs are changing, but with the implementation of the tax cap, uh, it has really handcuffed the community that is willing to pay for education and has in some ways pitted it against the portion of the community that finds it more difficult to pay for property taxes. Uh, in that the benefit of staying under the cap provides a rebate to homeowners and um, and it's implemented within the entire county. Uh, the issue for Port Washington in trying to maintain its program is that it has been spending down its fund balance. Certainly with the board's knowledge and understanding of what we've been doing um, and 
Uh, this year, for the first time, uh, the school district is now within the controller's report of being uh, susceptible to fiscal stress. Uh, and the board has been made aware of that program from its inception. So when they received the report on, on our being at a number of 31%, I don't think they will be especially surprised because two years ago uh, they tripled their usual contribution to offset taxes in order to maintain program for one particular fiscal year. Uh, next year, in planning for next year, that decision has not yet been made, uh, but it is an enormous part of our program to determine if we're not going to get the money from the state and we're handcuffed in getting the money from the community, the only other place for us to go to is fund balance. And that's the one thing that all of our school districts have in common. Those are generally our three sources of revenue and um, it's very hard to plan out for multiple years. And you also en mentioned um, an increasing number of immigrants. I was reviewing the data on unaccompanied minors, and I saw that about two-thirds of the 8,000 unaccompanied minors that came into New York State in 2014 and 2015 were from Long were in school districts, being educated in school districts on Long Island. So I, what I'm seeing is that student needs are increasing not only on the island, but around the state. And we're also seeing an increase in the percent of economically disadvantaged students um, in school districts all around the state. So that, that on the expense side, that creates the need for more resources and, and demands on the school district, which I think is, is an important factor that's going on. But let, let me now turn to the topic of piercing the tax cap and direct a question to Scott Taylor and Kendra Siever. Last year, the budget was defeated by the proposed override and passed with the second vote also for an override. What happened to make this work? Do you intend to override this year? I believe you said you were. And what's involved in executing a successful override? Well, <clears throat> for us, um, you know, one of the things that we did really from even the, the first vote and we probably did better for the second vote, was uh, educating the public on why we are in tough financial situations um, and what we've done to try to manage that over the past several years with the reductions we've made, but also educating them on uh, costs that we don't have control over, um, ERS, TRS, and so forth, uh, bargaining units, and, and all sort of things and educating them on, on that piece of it so that they under, really had a full understanding of, of what we've done and, and what we can't really do much with. We also were, we pointed out that impact of foundation aid and gap elimination adjustment and what that's meant to Tagus Central's uh, state aid picture. Um, so, oh, not really trying to vilify anybody, it, you know, it wasn't real popular with the local politicians that we pointed out that the shortcoming, you know, really our biggest issue was uh, what was coming out of Albany was not sufficient to fund our school. Um, and uh, and I think, you know, we tried to do that with the first, first vote, and I think it was just 30% was just too far. The second time, we made about 5% reductions, and then we had a gentleman step forward with a pretty large uh, contribution. So we were able to get down to 17%. What that did was I think it showed the community, one, that uh, we were willing to move, and we moved some. Uh, we moved about 5%, but we weren't willing to move, and we stuck to our guns in terms on saving student programs. Um, and, the, and, and we really hammered home the point that our students aren't going to be able to compete for college placements and job placements if we don't at least maintain the program we have. Um, and, and the community rallied behind that, particularly the parents. And, and that they came out in droves uh, for the second vote. 
Yeah. So, right, so you, imp you really improved your communication with the community, and you also reduced your levy ask to a level that they found tolerable for that second vote. What about the um, the rebate that taxpayers were going to get? Was that an impediment for you uh, last year, or do you think it will be this coming year? Uh, Deborah, this is Kendra, and I can kind of answer that for you. Um, our taxpayers, um, in the theory, because our tax on true is so low, um, the star rebate did not appear to be a factor. Um, when that got brought up at some of the public hearings that we had, um, the, the public really was not concerned about that because the checks that they had received in the first round were so small, um, that did not become a sticking point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me turn to Larry. You said you will not override the tax cap this year. Can you talk a little bit about the pressures that are preventing you to seek an override? And do you expect this star rebate to, um, to, to be one of those pressures? And then what are you doing to reduce costs but preserve programs? Sure. So the, uh, so the, the factors that you know, really keep us from wanting to uh, to pierce the tax cap. You know, one is certainly the star rebate. Um, you know, it's something that folks, uh, you know, have uh, have heard about. They've, um, you know, I don't want to say enjoyed the rebate in the past, but they've gotten some of their money back uh, as a result of that. Um, you know, and, and we don't want to uh, exacerbate any increases, um, you know, going forward by, um, <clears throat> by removing the possibility of, of that rebate. But the underlying uh, the underlying pressure for this is that our property tax rate is already much higher than it should be. Um, over the years, the, the residents of Schenectady have not wanted the school district to implode. Uh, certainly, you know, being shorted over $60 million annually on a budget that's about um, $185 million, that's, you know, that's a significant shortfall. And so the, the, the public has been willing uh, to to support um, increases that are that are beyond really what what it what they should be, and so at this point um, we're feeling like any any further increases that we make are going to be exacerbating uh, foreclosures and evictions and, and some very real um, difficult uh, pressures within a, a city that's already got uh, increasing poverty and, and decreasing uh, property wealth. And so those are those are some some significant issues for us uh, to deal with. But in terms of uh, reducing costs and preserving programs, you know, we're always looking to be more efficient. We're always looking to take advantage of, of attrition and see if there are ways in which we can, you know, um, get services done uh, in, a, in a more efficient way, have, have you know, people pick up uh, bits and pieces of services uh, as folks leave. But we also do a kind of a, you know, a return on investment analysis and, you know, making sure that of the things that we are currently offering, you know, let's take a look to see, you know, what what's that cost like? And not looking necessarily at cost per pupil, but trying to look at cost per success. And, you know, we've got some programs where, you know, what we've seen in the past is, you know, cost per success is pretty high, even if cost per student is relatively low. And so that's an area where, you know, we decide we're gonna we're gonna cut back, uh, either reduce or eliminate that program, um, and then either save money or redirect some of that money. Uh, to a different program that has a better uh, cost per success ratio. Thank you. Well, let me turn to Mary uh, and ask if if you think that the star rebate uh, for taxpayers is going to be a problem in Port Washington seeking an override as well, and what you might be doing to reduce costs but preserve programs. I do think that the rebate will be a problem, um, although each year that rebate seems to uh, diminish the, uh, the salary or the household income on the basis for that rebate is getting lower each year and the, um, the amount of the rebate is getting smaller, but right now I think it is still significant enough for um, the board to be concerned that there would not be full support for an override. Um, it puts us in a very difficult position because, as I said earlier, we do have growing enrollment. It is a year in which 
we're actually trying to increase our ESL department. We need additional elementary teachers uh, because we're bursting at the seams. And um, there are other items uh, in physical education that need to happen, all the specials that then uh, also have to be added on to if you in increase your number of elementary sections. It all goes together. And um, looking in terms of what can be cut, uh, while for us, perhaps people think that this was frivolous to begin with, but over the years we have already cut elementary clubs, JV teams, uh, late buses. Um, we have had very successful teacher and other bargaining unit negotiations where we have had zero settlements in terms of percentages, even though we all know that, generally speaking, many of those contracts do have steps. There have been no additional percentages over those. There have been re reductions in the teacher benefit trust fund. Uh, so. I keep going back to the three sources, the uh, taxing the community, which in our case is over 90% of our income, uh, the state aid, which is just about 5% of our income, and uh, the balance from local revenues and fund balance. So I am, I am truly hoping uh, that there will be a change in the final state aid. That's what we are also hearing from Senator Flanagan. Uh, and perhaps that will help us make up some of the, the money we need to at least bring in the ESL staffing. And we are, we are going to work hard to make sure that the legislature uh, does its full job of, of making um, aid uh, more palatable for, for everyone. And I must also add that I believe my colleagues in Suffolk are the ones that are really dealing with a greater influx of unaccompanied minors. And uh, the state aid really doesn't reflect that. Years and years ago, there, there used to be a line specifically for uh, other than speakers as an aid but that has long since been changed and put into foundation aid, which for us has, doesn't move a penny. Yeah, and um, I know the regions have revised their Part 154 regulations to beef up services for English learners and without having the funds there to support that work. Uh, which is a problem. So this is an area that I know was being discussed when the uh, Commissioner Elio was before the legislature today, and it's something that uh, the Education Conference Board, of which New York State ASBO is a member, is putting out a paper uh, very soon to draw attention to it. So an, an, important, um, an important area for sure. Um, so uh, Larry Spring mentioned using a filter of return on investment to reallocate resources and to make sure that the budget had the most advantage for students and that you were uh, cutting things that had, were less impactful, that kind of thing. I, I want to turn with this topic to this topic because really for the past seven years, school districts have had to do more with less. So let me turn to um, Scott Taylor and Kendra Siever, uh, because your district participated in a project of strategic resource use with consultants from Education Resource Strategies in the State Education Department. How has this affected your ability to fund your budget? Are there additional options for you to reduce costs and preserve programs? What are the costs to students you serve? of complying with the tax cap and receiving only a modest increase, say 4% in state aid. And, and is this strategic resource use uh, going to help you in that process? Uh, yeah, the, the study we participated in um, was about a year-long study. There's about eight, eight districts across the state. And what they did is they came in and they looked at all the districts involved in the study and looked at 
really every department in your uh, in your in your district: transportation, food service, uh, custodial, uh, instructional, and so forth. And they they looked at it across the board and looked where uh, compared you with districts across the state in a state average, and even they compared it with some national data. And what they came up with was, uh, or what they were trying to identify for districts was where are there opportunities for you to reallocate resources. So for example, if you were heavy in your custodial department, could you maybe make a reduction there and reallocate those resources into an instructional um, program or, or teacher? And uh, for us, the, when the study came back, they found really that the past five or six years of reductions, about 20% of our staff. Some programs we'd already reduced, uh, reduced by an administrator, uh, several teachers, closed the building. All those moves that we had already made, it put us in a position where really the only thing they could identify was maybe about half a position in custodial that where we could save and then reallocate <coughs> those resources. And that was actually something we did in last year's budget. We made some reductions in that department. Um, from the standpoint of helping us get the budget passed, it provided us with data that wasn't our own, but we used as part of our, our budget meetings with the community to show them you know, how uh, efficient we've been operating for several years, and, and it, it reinforced the information we provided in terms of cuts and what we've done to try to, try to hold costs down to the local taxpayer. So it was very beneficial for us yes, in that so, uh, Superintendent Taylor, um, now that you've gone through that project process with ERS, um, will you be able to continue to use that process as you go forward? Uh, yeah, I think you know. Really, we've got all the data from it. Um, I think we can continue to, you know, look at our own uh, what we're what we're doing in house. So as we go to make some changes, what's that going to do to those figures uh, in those different departments? Um, the other thing that, and probably one of the very beneficial pieces for us, was that it came up with some instructional de or school design options um, in which we could take, because we have been reducing uh, so much, what could we do with school design to not necessarily reduce the number of staff, uh, but utilize them in a way to more effectively instruct students. And, and we actually, be through the pilot or through this study, we're able to get a, a pilot funded uh, that we ran this year in our second grade uh, using the, the data that we were provided in that study. So and that's been very positive for us um, on many levels. And uh, so you know, moving forward, that's that's going to maybe be the biggest piece for us is how to more efficiently uh, run our classrooms. Yes, I think so. And you know, New York State ASBO is really interested in in what you went through, and we've talked to other school districts as well. We're looking to get some um, grant money so that other school districts can have the benefit of going through this process and the support of collecting and analyzing the data and better aligning their budgets to support um, improvements in student achievement. So we we will be working on that. Um, now, many of our listeners are in the process of developing budgets to present to the voters in May. I, I want to ask, uh, I'll start with Larry Spring, uh, what budget strategies has Connectivity used to cope with its economic situation, and what budget strategies do you plan to use this year? So one of the things that, uh, that we've done in past years when we've had uh, significant budget shortfalls and, and cuts that we've had to make is uh, you know we we developed a budget workbook tool for engagement with the public, and you know all areas that that we think are you know possible in any way of uh, being savings. You know places where we could create efficiencies, places where we could reduce what we're doing, or even cut uh, entirely what what we were doing for students um, or or for staff or other places where we're expending monies. We put put them together in a workbook, assigned a value to them, uh, so that uh, you know they they would account for some percentage of you know the the budget gap that that we're seeking to to bridge. 
and ask groups of people from uh, you know different constituencies, whether they're staff, parents, uh, or members of the public that that don't have a formal connection to the school, uh, to then work through those items um, and in a small group reach consensus on what combination of those items uh, would they recommend to get us to and bridge how that did gap. Using that tool help you compared to what you did before you used the tool. <clears throat> Well, it you know it certainly did uh, two things for us. Um, you know, in a very technical sense, it made sure that we had lots of information about unintended consequences of what some of these uh, savings would be, things that you might not think about. Um, you know, in a second or third uh, ripple effect of, of you know what happens if you know you cut this. It, you know, and it, and it helps to inform you about what um, you know what it is that people value and just how large uh, a change that that takes you know you know the bigger the change the more the change effort in, in making that happen but probably the the most significant thing that it did was it built a lot of community empathy for the budget process it built empathy for what decisions the board needed to make and it built empathy for uh, what recommendations the, the administration and, and I was making to the board and so even though we were making really significant cuts um, you know some dramatic reductions we actually had really strong public support uh, for that budget because we had uh, hundreds and hundreds of people who had been through that exercise who you know themselves were kind of wringing their hands and you know struggling with what what they would make as recommendations and how to do that and it got folks uh, kind of energized and mobilized in terms of you know geez we, we really don't have uh, very many places to go to cut this we are a really efficient district um, the problem is not um, whether or not uh, you know we like this budget the problem is you know we're, we're not being funded enough and so we had better at least uh, support this budget that public buy-in was a really important consequence of this process that you went through with this uh, workbook or work what did you call it yeah it's a yeah a workbook and it really did make people feel that they they were engaged in that process you know we gave them you know very real things to wrestle with this is exactly what we're wrestling with this is the way we deal with it internally you know we'd like to know how you think about it and um, you know we gave them plenty of time and and the real dilemmas to work through um, and it was uh, it, it created a new appreciation of the work and it gave uh, gave folks um, you know I think a, a better opportunity to buy into what the district was putting out ultimately as a budget thank you Larry uh, Mary Callahan uh, what budget strategies has Port Washington used to cope and what do you plan to use this year well over the past uh, we have as I mentioned uh, done a series of cuts and perhaps some of them uh, different from Larry's were not as well planned uh, having reduced some of our guidance and librarians and um, ultimately in subsequent years uh, did return those people from part-time back to full-time and the way we were able to at least do that was through attrition of uh, employees retiring. Uh, over the past five years, we have um, allowed sev 17 positions to attrition, uh, and we have 315 more students than we had when we had those 17 additional teachers. So, uh, let me ask. Do you have some kind of a plan that guided when you had attrition where you would um, rehire or redirect resources? Um, at the time of the individual attritions, we certainly did look at class size and uh, offerings at the high school in particular. Uh, but that oftentimes is a one-year fix because the following year, enrollment can change very differently and that one teacher that perhaps it was a luxury to have replaced um, is definitely needed so that then caused the class sizes to balloon and I would say that that has been the strategy here over the years uh, attrition and larger class sizes and nipping away at the outsides of uh, programs 
trying to maintain uh, the successes, whether that was uh, the Intel Science Program or a Gifted and Talented Program that we do have at the elementary school, whether it's providing for the special ed at the full complement of its needs and providing for the ENL, but uh, we keep getting the, uh, the additional financial pressure. And this year, I am not sure, uh, other than this uh, community forum, to see whether the community would support an increase in the tax levy, uh, what the next step will be. And it's interesting with a tax cap that is just a smidgen over zero, whether <laughs> right. communities might say, well, let's go like for a 2% uh, increase and, and pierce the cap, but at a low level at 2%. It would be interesting to see what school districts are going to do. Right, because I, um, as, as some of my colleagues um, have talked about, um, a 17% or a 30% budget increase, but in it's hard to compare districts that way because for me, a 1% budget increase would be a million four. <laughs> Certainly, if that were the same in Tioga, no yeah, one would be talking Tioga. about a 10% increase. <laughs> yes, yes. If I can chime in for a minute, this is Scott, a 30% increase was going to be about 900000 for us. Right. So, um, yeah, yep. it's, it's, very, it's very specific to your community, I, but the overall issue is not getting the appropriate funding for, um, for, for student needs. I have full support for the needs in Schenectady. I, I believe that we're supposed to be providing a free, appropriate education, and maybe in some school districts that can't include gifted and talented. But I think that the poverty level in New York State is becoming a major uh, problem far more than it had been uh, for many years, and that the state is really not recognizing that need. Yes, and I, I, I think that this, what I'm seeing from this conversation is this is affecting all types of school districts, some more and some less, but it, it is a factor that all school districts have to deal with. And I, I think this, in my mind, raises questions about tax tolerance in school districts and what school districts can do to increase taxpayers' contributions to schools. So I want to throw out a question to all of you and just have you respond as you relate to this. Um, compared to the nation, we live in a state that spends a lot on education and taxes a lot. However, I think this is in the process of changing and certainly varies a lot around the state. To what extent does your district have a culture of low tax tolerance? To what extent have comptroller's audits or other reports documenting your district's tax effort compared to similar districts influenced your ability to increase local taxes? Would anyone like to take that on? I'll start, I'll start if you don't mind. This is Scott at Tauga Central. You know, in terms of the tax tolerance and, and what I've seen since I've been superintendent and what we've experienced during this economic downturn and, and lack of aid, is that the, the community was, uh, you know, we were making uh, cuts in, uh, in teachers and programs. They were still more concerned about having a low tax rate than, than what was actually happening in their school in terms of um, loss of programs, loss of staffing, and so forth. So, you know, for us, when we, we decided to pierce the tax cap, you know, that certainly was uh, raised a lot of ire um, when we did that. Uh, however, you know, part of that for us is just re-educating our community on that. And, what, and something that has been beneficial to us in kind of a backhanded way, I believe, is a comptroller's audit. Um, a year ago, we were identified as a district with moderate fiscal stress, largely due to use of uh, reserve funds and fund balance um, to, to help keep the ship afloat while keeping our tax rates uh, low. And the audit, when they came in once we were identified, you know, actually took showed our 
uh, our combined wealth ratio in comparison to similar districts within our county um, and our ability to, to pay or our ability to tax our community or raise money locally, I should say, um, was much greater than what we were taking advantage of. And their audit really laid that out pretty well for us in terms of where our budget sat compared to similar districts. We're about $2 million lower than a similar district uh, on our budget, and, but our ability to raise local levy was as great as those districts. And really what we needed to do moving forward uh, to, to have healthy uh, fiscal position and balanced budgets is, is to really address our, our tax levy, which, of course, is, opposes the tax cap. But in essence, that's what the, the audit uh, said. And I believe the comptroller is just now sending out uh, fiscal stress reports and scores to uh, school districts. So that may be another factor that you can take to your communities, which will help them to understand where they sit compared to other school districts and, um, and focus them more on the job that the school districts have in front of them. Would anyone else like to comment on this question of uh, low tax tolerance and how to deal with that? Uh, this is Mary here in Port Washington. I've been here for 16 years. This community has always had a low tolerance for uh, large increases in any way, shape, or form. Um, and when the, the North Shore of Long Island is considered a very wealthy area, in fact, we are considered one of the 10 wealthiest school districts on Long Island. But you wouldn't know it when it comes to budget time. And um, we have tried uh, re-educating the uh, community uh, and informing them that based on our tax increases all these years that I have been here, Versus our surrounding districts, where we, there are approximately 12 in, in our group, um, we have always been either number 11 or number 12 in terms of tax increase for them and the cost per student. And um, there was a time when, before the tax cap where there was a glimmer of hope that the community would have uh, been more understanding of maintaining their home values, but with the economy going down at the same time the tax cap went into place and homeowners seeing the values of their homes going down as a natural ripple effect of the economy, it's been very hard to even think of approaching them to uh, pierce the cap. Yes, thank you. And um, Larry, do you have a last word on this? I know you've already said that your the effort of taxpayers in connection is too high. So uh, this maybe is not even uh, appropriate for your for your district. But um, do you have any comments on it? Sure. So you know, even though you know, I mean, we when we assess that, we look at uh, you know taxes being too high already. But um, you know, the public you know, is, is supportive of the schools. Um, you know, the last two votes that we've, we've been out to, uh, you know, increasing taxes uh, for the budget as well as uh, a capital project, uh, you know, both reached a supermajority, even though we were not looking to exceed the cap. Um, you know, so that, so that the populace is supportive of the school. They recognize that they have an effort to make, um, you know, the comptroller's audits and, uh, and other information you know, really just galvanizes the public around uh, the issue of, um, you know, uh, the state the, the state shortchanging Schenectady in foundation aid um, and supporting Schenectady in, uh, you know, the, the civil rights complaint that we have against, uh, against New York State regarding that funding. Well, we certainly hope that you and uh, many other school districts are are successful in this quest to get foundation aid back on track, um, knowing that it is going to be a hard lift. Uh, let me turn to Matt Darius. Do we have any other questions uh, from um, participants? We do not have any questions queued up at this time. 
Okay, terrific. Well, I want to thank everyone for uh, signing in, and especially I want to thank uh, Larry Spring, Mary Callahan, Scott Taylor, and Kendra, Kendra Siever for your insights on this topic, and um, hope everyone has a terrific day, and we will do our best at the budget hearing. Thank you all.